I am an artist and a programmer. That juxtaposition usually surprises people. But it may surprise you less when I tell you that my mom is an artist and my dad is an engineer. It was almost inevitable that I would develop a passion for the intersection of art and technology. As a child, I was inspired by all the wonderful things that surrounded me, including computers. The computer that graced our desk in the mid-80s when I was six or seven years old was a Commodore 64. One of my favorite things to do was to flip to the back of the latest issue of 321 Contact magazine to the section titled Basic Training, which had a very simple computer program. I turn on the computer and I'm greeted by a blinking cursor, the pulse of possibility. <laughs> I start typing the code into the computer very carefully, character by character, line by line, and then I run the program and nothing happens. So I go back to the top, looking back and forth between the screen and the magazine until I find that tiny little mistake, or two or three. Then the program runs and a little game or animation or picture appears magically on the screen. Frustrating? Yes. But empowering, too. I was able to make the computer do really cool things once I got it right. And if I got it wrong, it wasn't catastrophic. I couldn't really break anything. I could just start over and try again. This early experience taught me that it was OK to make mistakes. I felt like the magazine and the computer had given me permission and a safe place to make mistakes. Fast forward to 2010. I'm experimenting with some code that can animate a million particles in real time. There's an unwanted side effect that's causing the particle system to collapse. And in order to fix it, I add a teeny bit of randomness into the system. All of a sudden, things go crazy on the screen. Something's definitely wrong, but I'm captivated by the motion. I'd added way too much randomness. Technically, it was a mistake. But I used that mistake and its intriguing results to create an interactive art app called Beautiful Chaos. This kind of serendipity actually happens a lot in my artistic practice. Making art with code has taught me that mistakes can have unexpectedly good outcomes. That's not always the case, of course. But when it happens, it's like a little reward for all the hard work and perseverance. About a year and a half ago, my friend Bill handed me his blank notebook and asked me if I could illustrate it for him. I wrote some code based on a classic design you may recognize from a Joy Division album cover. In my version, I embedded Bill's name in a landscape of audio waveforms. I had the design, but I didn't know how to get it on the cover. This was a brand new medium for me. Eventually, after a lot of trial and error, I found a wax paper transfer method that worked pretty well. Bill was thrilled with the result, and everyone we showed it to loved it. It was a fun little project. But Bill had his notebook, and I had this new technique, and wanted to go further with it. After some brainstorming sessions with him and a few other friends, I decided to make more notebooks using maps for the cover design. Oh, maps. Looking at a map, I see travel, adventure, discovery. I love getting away from home and experiencing life in other places. I want to know about those in-between spaces. And when I return to my city, I see it with new eyes. My city is very car-centric, but we do have a growing number of public transportation options. What if I designed a map that showed everywhere you could go via bus, bike, and rail? I had the concept, but I had no idea how to make a beautiful custom map design. I learned about an amazing online global repository of geographic data called OpenStreetMap. And over the course of a long weekend, after a lot of trial and error, I learned how to download the data, cut it up into the layers I was interested in, and finesse it into unique and beautiful map design. I had my first notebook. I started to show it off, and people not only loved it, they wanted to buy it. So I started to think about how to best go about that. Was this project something I could really throw myself and my career into? I decided to do a few small experiments, selling them online at my friend Kim's bookstore and at pop-up shops around the city. With a lot of trial and error, I started to get a handle on what worked and what didn't. OK, next hurdle, production. 
There was no way I could sustain the demand with my current technique. It was time consuming and prone to errors. My friend Sean suggested that I try out his new laser cutter. I didn't know anything about laser engraving. But once again, with a lot of help, trial, and error, I learned how to make the notebooks with this new technique. The notebooks have gone through so many iterations over the last year and a half. And at times, I wish I could move forward faster. But I've managed to learn a lot by embracing this cycle of trial and error. I have an idea, try something, take some false steps, reach out for help, make some progress. In this process, mistakes are small and frequent, not catastrophic and rare. By keeping the cycle going, the mistakes become a valuable part of moving towards my goal. There's an interesting dynamic in my life between perfectionism and programming. In programming, I make a lot of mistakes. Maybe there's something about programming that draws in perfectionists and detail-oriented people and then challenges those same people to accept imperfection. Despite my tendency toward perfectionism, missing something in programming is not as big a deal to me anymore. Just recently, someone emailed me about a problem they were having with Beautiful Chaos. After some emails back and forth to clarify the issue, I dove into the code, made the necessary fixes and updates, and released a new version of the app. I was really thankful that he had taken the time to let me know that something needed to be fixed. And everyone was better off because of our willingness to engage with one another and with the problem. But in other areas of life, insecurities abound, and I'm still afraid to make a single miscalculation. Like when I'm looking for freelance work. Am I qualified enough to bid on this project? If I get the gig, will I be able to deliver? Why didn't they get back to me? Was it something I said? And in relationships, how do I express my anger in a way that's not hurtful? If I get into this debate, will I even be able to back up my own opinion? If I share my heart, will I still be accepted? The problem is things do go wrong. I've spent all day setting up an art exhibit only to be told it had to come down because the furniture in the venue was going to be replaced. I've had breakdowns in communication with my wife where I said something I thought was justified but was really just controlling and self-righteous. Mistakes can lead to pain. But I've realized they're part of the process, period. You aren't going to get to a point, even as a very experienced programmer or successful entrepreneur or loving spouse or capable parent where you don't mess things up sometimes. If you want to get over your fear of failure, you have to get really good at making mistakes. How do you do that? Embrace a cycle of trial and error where mistakes are small and frequent, not catastrophic and rare. Look forward to the unexpectedly good outcomes that mistakes can bring. And find someone who gives you permission and a safe place to make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. I give you permission.